my topic today is growing in wisdom. And uh, the idea being that I think sometimes we think, look at the book of Proverbs and we think of wisdom and we're reading through uh, Proverbs and it kind of turns into a Confucius sort of thing. Like, wow, that one's real interesting. Maybe it'll stick. And you kind of try something out and throw spaghetti at the wall. But I think, and seeing what sticks, but I think uh, wisdom, there's actually, uh, I think, kind of a process. Uh, you know, Jesus grew in wisdom. Samuel grew in wisdom. Solomon clearly was growing in wisdom whenever he had his prayer. And, uh, and so I just want to see if there's maybe something we can do to be more active and intentional in trying to grow in, in, grow in wisdom. Uh, our verse for today that we're starting with, kind of for the, the overarching theme or motivation, is Ephesians 5, 15 and 16. And so I'll read that real quick. It says, uh, look carefully then how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise, making the best use of time because the days are evil. And so there's a couple things I want to learn right from this, right out of the gate. So if you read with me again, it says, look carefully then how you walk. I think this means we have a tendency to not look carefully. We're walking daily. We walk every day. But our tendency is to not look carefully. It takes a lot of effort to think of your next day. I think a lot of times we can kind of stumble in to our day and to not really walk carefully. So we want to think. The word prudence means to look ahead and think ahead of what's going to occur. Uh, so we don't want to walk as unwise. We want to walk as wise. Uh, and then the next verse saying, making the best use of time, which means we have a tendency to waste our time. Sometimes we feel like I have a ton of time. But if you compare our time here on earth to the time we have in eternity, we actually have a limited amount of time. And if you think of all the time that we have to just doing jobs and taking care of ourselves and sleeping, our actual time is pretty limited. So this is saying, hey, make the best use of the time because the days are evil. If you're not controlling your time carefully, your time will control you and you're just going to consume, it'll, it'll consume you. This is not a salvation issue. And so today, if you're looking for salvation, look, you know, faith in God alone is going to save you. We are worthy of, uh, of the death. Uh, and Christ came and, and saved us, and so we need to believe in Christ for the forgiveness of sins. This is about how we can live skillfully. Uh, and that, that's what wisdom, this is how we can bear fruit better. Uh, that's, that's, that's what today is. I want to give you a list of topics that sometimes we talk generically about wisdom, and I just want to blast through a list. And if you should have, you've probably struggled with these items or worked on these items before, or maybe you're working on them now, or you're going to be working on them. If you're not doing any of those three, I just don't believe you. And so I'd like almost have to meet you after church and we'd have to talk because it's like these are just part of life that we are all going through. And it'd be awesome if we could be skillful at. I'm just going to go through this list real quick without spending too much time on it. Waking up in the morning. When do you wake up? When did you wake up today? When are you going to wake up tomorrow? Why do you wake up when you wake up? When does God want you to wake up? Are there verses that kind of give us an idea of maybe when we could or should wake up? Again, not a salvation issue, but whether we eat, drink, or whatever we do, we do it all to the glory of God, right? So all these things are meaningful, and they do matter. And so that's my first example. Our diet, our, our weight, how much do you weigh? How much did you want to weigh? How much do you think God wants you to weigh? Health is more than weight. And so, like, I ate a whole lot of fried food for probably a decade. I'm going to pay for that. And, uh, you know, I'm a pretty skinny guy, but that's, you know, but the point being is that, like, we want to live intentionally. Uh, you know, we have, con we have some degree of influence on our weight. What, is, what should our weight be? Are we living in a wise way with regards to our health? Reading the Bible. Troy kind of challenges us every year. Hey, let's read through the Bible. And we kind of try to do these sort of things. Let the word dwell in you richly. How often are we doing that? It takes about just, you might have heard this before. If you have, maybe this will help you. It's about 52 hours of reading and or listening to get through the Bible-ish. It comes out to about 10, 12 minutes a day. And so I don't know about you guys, if you've ever gone to the, hey, how much time do you spend on the you know, Candy Crush app or whatever that is? It shows you how many minutes you kind of spent on things. Just kind of putting it into perspective as to kind of what's required for that commitment. Yeah, it's a hard thing to do. But I guess the question being, are we skilled at letting the Word dwell in us richly? Procrastination, homework, kids. Do your teachers say that you're really good at homework? Do you wait to the last minute all the time? Are you doing these things as though you're doing them for the Lord? Are our houses clean? Do we like how clean they are? Do we have an influence over how clean our houses are? Uh, how clean should they be? What does it mean to be hospitable? What, 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 would be, what would God be? You know, there's different seasons. Some of us have kids. Some of us have no kids. Some of us have tons of kids. 
old kids, young, I, I get it. This is, uh, if this is like, uh, I am generalizing, generalizing today. So take what applies to you. What is it? It says encourage the faint-hearted and admonish the unruly. So if you're faint-hearted today, God's doing great things in all of us, and I can see it. If you're unruly today, and this is applying to you, it needs to go, go ahead and let it hit you, because it's kind of supposed to. That's what we're doing. Um, and so this is not really normal. This is kind of what I've chosen to do, though. Money. Money is generic. There's actually a lot of parts to money. When I'm reading Proverbs, there's saving, there's giving, there's, uh, there's making money. You can make a ton of money, but if you don't ever save and you don't ever give, have you ever seen that before? It all comes in, it goes out, the guy's spending a whole lot of money on himself. Alternatively, we've got guys sometimes that are really good at giving. They give everything away, but they don't make any money to hardly take care of themselves, and everybody's having to kind of take care of them. Uh, so, uh, memorizing, addiction. Addictions can be pornography, can be alcohol, could be really normal stuff like hobbies or games or sports or music or whatever. Uh, growing in patience, is that something you've wanted to be skillful at for a long time? When you say yes, do you mean yes? Do you do what you say? Do you say what you do? Do you romance your spouse as much as you'd like? Do you remember, do that as much as God would like to have you to demonstrate and represent God uh, with your marriage? Do you use your phone as much as you like? How much did you use it last week? Do you know? How much should we be using it? Are we in control of our phone or is our phone in control of us? Discipleship, are you participating in any kind of discipleship? Right? You know, because the word tells us to be in these interactions. It doesn't give a real rigid, there's not a book. I mean, there's books, you can find one, but like the Bible's actually, you know, kind of loose on that. But if we're not doing it at all, I'm guaranteed we're not doing, doing it right, right? You know what? So, and there's plenty more. You guys could probably come to parenting. I mean, there's a bunch of these things. And I just wanted to hit pause and say, we learn a lot at church when we come in, but we want to not just be hearers, we want to be doers. And in these areas of life, it's just critical. Scripture says, I want to give you three good reasons why we want to progress. And my heart is for that you guys would progress and that I also would progress. I think we're simple and we don't progress in these areas sometimes. It hurts our witness. So the gospel message is hindered whenever we don't progress in these areas. Uh, if you hear the gospel is the power of God's salvation, yes. And so when you present the gospel, God will work miraculously on another man's heart and will can, can draw. But we play a role, Scripture says. So like, if you see somebody sharing the gospel, but their finances are a total train wreck, and you got to like, after he shares the gospel with you, you have to buy his lunch so he can eat it. Or, uh, you know, if somebody's trying to share the gospel with you in their house is a train wreck. Or if their kids are going nuts, or there's, you know, there's just a lot of chaos and they have no control, they can't hold down a job. It's not that it can't produce, because the power of God is the gospel, but we play a role and we can hinder the gospel with our lives. We want to live skillfully. We have everything at our disposal. We have the Holy Spirit. We have the Word of God that tells us how to live skillfully. And we have the body of Christ. And we're supposed to be part of a body. And we're supposed to be involved in each other's life with this discipleship and, and trying to encourage each other. And so it hinders the gospel. We don't have fruit if we don't improve in these areas. If you're stagnant forever, you don't want to be fruitless guy when the time comes to the end and you're the wood, hay, and stubble guy. There will be a judgment of all of our actions. Sometimes it doesn't feel like it because we're like, hey, I'm saved by grace and praise God and that's amazing. But there's a judgment, and God's taking into account, even right now, your thoughts that are in your head and the things that you say. And, and there'll be a judgment. We need to fear God. And we don't, it allows us to be fruitful if we improve and grow in wisdom in these areas. Finally, there's just normal, there's just blessing. If you've ever taught your kid before, hey, work really hard, and you'll get you know, money for this job. Hey, study for this test, and you'll get this A, and you get the reward for that. There's just a general blessing. If you read Proverbs, it's not like a prophecy. You'll always get whatever that is. But in general, if you sow, then you will reap. There's a psalm I ran across in my reading. I think I should have read it. But uh, it was in Psalm 80. I may have heard it. The Israelites are being stubborn. And then at once, it's just a visual. It says, in the Psalms, says, if you would just open your mouth, I would fill it. Um, but, but they wouldn't open their mouth. And so it's like, it's got, it's got all this stuff. And, but it's like, you, got, you can't even open your mouth enough for me to, you know, to participate in this. And uh, anyway, I think we are to grow in wisdom. I'm going to, it's got to move along. So, so grab an area. If any of these, if none of that resonated with you, I don't, 
you know, I don't know, but like some of that should have, hey, I want to grow in that area. I want to be wise in that area. How beautiful would it be if Jan excelled in an area and we went to the her and learned in that, and then Giovanni excelled in another area, and then, uh, you know, Robert's crushing it with his, with his finances, and uh, David Baker's parenting, and then, uh, you know, Dave Coronado is the model of not procrastinating. Like, if you, if you found people in that were, like, just amazing at these areas, how amazing would that be? We should be, as a part of a body, being able to connect with each other. So I just want you to have a vision for what we could and what God would hope us, for us to be, and what that would do for the gospel, what that would do for us, and what that would do with the Day of Judgment. Now I'm going to give you two problems and one solution. One, uh, and there's a lot to it, but I've chosen this one. And it's that the no, problem number one is that we love being simple. We're going to talk about simple people again. We talked about it in, uh, in our equipping hour briefly. And I think one of our challenges is that it's not that we're all simple when you come in and I've got a simple shirt and I'm a simple guy. And like you're a wise guy and you're a fool guy. Like we all have different areas of our life, right, where we're excelling and others where we're, you know, just behaving as a simple person or behaving as a fool. But, so as I'm speaking, just say, again, if these areas and you're stuck in a rut, maybe I'm simple. And, and the, the verse, the main key, oh, sorry, I was going to explain my sermon here, but we love being simple, and that's a problem. Problem number two is we don't have self-control. So how do we escape the simplicity of this rut? We don't have any self-control. The Bible tells us to have self-control. It's a fruit of the Spirit. We should have self-control. And it, it is one of the vehicles as to how we can escape simplicity. And then finally, we're gonna, there's a, the solution is this process of growing in wisdom. Like I said, Samuel Gomer is when Jesus grew in wisdom. Uh, we don't know, uh, obviously Solomon grew in wisdom. Uh, there, there's not like a how-to manual, one, two, three, but I am going to try to give what I see is potentially like a cycle of how we can grow as part of a process in wisdom. Uh, and so we're going to go through that. And then I'll be done. But so to begin with, I think that a lot of us are simple. If you've been stuck in any of these areas for a long time, and maybe you've worked on them, or you thought you were excelling, but you're not really excelling, and we're not skillful in those areas, it could be that we're behaving in a simple way. Psalm uh, one, sorry, Proverbs one twenty two is the, kind of the key verse for simple and learning simple, uh, how that works. It says, "How long, O simple ones, will you love being simple?" And the two words in that verse that I want us to key in on is long and love. And so we can learn from the simple person. The simple person is going to be stuck for a long time. And so if you find that you've been stuck for a long time, uh, maybe you're simple in this particular area. And we need to escape simplicity. Why does it occur? There's, man, there's another word in there that says that we love being simple. So a lot of times in an area of life, we just don't want to go through the trouble of getting up at the time maybe we're supposed to. We don't want to go through the effort of, uh, of, of memorizing. Um, we don't want to, we don't want to take the effort to, to control the phone, so we just allow the phone to control us. So if we love being simple, you know, if we love being simple, we'll stay there, and we're going to stay there for a long time. So you can kind of identify where each of us and probably yourselves are being simple in these areas. Another attribute of the simple is that they believe everything. And so uh, they're real naive. And this could look a couple different ways. You know, you ask most people if, if they think they're more attractive than most people, and most people say, yeah, I'm more attractive than most people. You ask most people, they do surveys, if you ask people in their 20s or 30s right now, you know, like, when do you think you'll retire? And how much do you think you'll have? And they have, like, kind of some number out there. But then, like, uh, and then, I mean, it's like a high percentage of them. Are just, they think they've got this situation figured out. But then, then they examine their they survey, their finances. There's like nothing there. So it's like you know, there's no connection to reality. And I think a lot of times we're naive about our current state. Another thing is sometimes you're naive about what you can accomplish. You're like, okay, uh, I'm going to move this move, and it's going to change. Like, if you find the New Year's goal type attitude, and like you keep trying this thing, and nothing's really moving. Uh, maybe you're simple and you're just being kind of naive. You just believe everything. You believe it's just going to change on its own. I'm, somehow I'm going to get to this retirement. Somehow I'm going to reduce some weight. Somehow my house is going to get clean. I'm not going to make any major you know, changes. So the you know, opposite of this in Scripture is the prudence. It says the prudence sees danger and they hide. 
And so they can, remember that first verse we said you want to consider carefully your steps? The prudent does that. They look ahead and say, what's coming around the corner? What's going to occur? What problems are they going to run into? How can I avoid those things? So it says the prudent see danger and hide, but the simple go on and suffer. So the simple, the fool will go run in, put his hand on the stove, and then go, ah! And then the fool will be like, man, that made me mad. I'm going to try to beat it. And then try the other hand. Like, ah! They're burning the other, you know. Fools only speak one language. They have to burn their hands. They only feel pain. They only feel the rod. Like, if you're a fool in an area here today, there's nothing I'm telling you that's going to matter to you. Why do I know that? The scripture tells me there's just nothing that's going to matter. You're going to have to, and parents, you know that it's painful when you see kids. Your kids are foolish in an area. It's like, it does not matter what I say. They're just like banging their heads on the wall. They're getting the rod. They're running into trouble. And, and that, anyway, that's what a fool is. Simple, the simple might see, and they have an opportunity to do okay. Maybe somebody's been trying to counsel them. Maybe somebody's taught them, you know, on, on Sunday. Uh, maybe they've seen an example, but they still, they just want to go in and try it out. And they'll try it out, and they're going to get burned. And then sometimes they'll learn, and they won't do that anymore. But Proverbs says, simple ones, how long will you love being simple? We don't have to be simple. We can get prudent. So some of the prescriptions for this is Proverbs tell us, hey, oh, simple, uh, Proverbs helps the simple learn prudence. Um, in Proverbs 1, 4, it says it gives prudence to the simple. If you don't do that, if prudence is thinking ahead, it's live, walking carefully, uh, the adulteress in Proverbs 5, 6 says she doesn't ponder the path of life. She's not thinking of her past. She's just living each day. That's easy. That's fun. But that's not how God called us. He wants us to love us with his, all his, our mind, and that involves thinking intentionally. That might kind of seem scripted or boring, but they want, he, God wants us to live in a way that uh, is wise so we make the best use of our days. It says this adulteress continuing to speak in Proverbs 5, 6, her ways wander and she does not know it. Do you feel like that you've gone through and maybe you've tried to address these areas that were in your life and you're like nothing's really happening? It might be that your ways are wandering and you don't even know it. So the simple person might have this naive assumption that somehow they're making progress and nothing's actually occurring. So we're trying to escape Simplicity. There's really good news for us, though. In Psalm 116.6, there's a verse that says, and this is, I find a lot of, this is helpful, the Lord preserves the simple. He doesn't say that about the fool. Like, if you look for redeeming verses about the fool, usually the fool's just going to get it. I don't know, sometimes they, you beat it out of them, but like, this verse says that the Lord preserves the simple. So a lot of us grow through our Christian walk from the simple. We try to want, we want the simple to become wise, and that's a good thing that God um, is saying that that is possible. At least I find, I find, uh, I'm grateful for that because I know where I am simple in some of these areas, and I'm not going anywhere. I'm glad that God is going to preserve that, and He's continuing to give me opportunities to do that. Well, so we talked about the fool. Uh, I think that we're simple. Uh, the sluggard doesn't get up in the morning. He doesn't want to do anything. He's clearly going to be fruitless. That's just another character in Proverbs I just wanted to mention. There's a scoffer. So if you ever hear the word scoffer, the scoffer might be super capable. He might actually be kind of smart, but basically he's going to be stuck in a rock where he's at because if you try to teach him anything, he's already going to know what's going on. He's going to, you basically, you can't correct or improve a scoffer. And then another character in Proverbs is the wise uh, this is kind of a rabbit trail, but I did want to touch on that. Because when I was reading Proverbs, I found all these characters. The wise, like, make lemonade out of lemons all the time. They're just crushing it. Like most of us, right, two steps forward, one step back. If you're wise in an area or if you see somebody that's wise in an area, it's like they take two steps forward and they just keep taking two steps forward. It's like they can get put in really weird situations with really weird counselors, and they just keep, they take a beating and they keep learning and they grow, and they're like, man, that guy's just went way past me in this particular area. So if you see that, it's probably God helping that person grow in wisdom and they're wise in that area. And that's what, man, that's what our heart, my heart is for us as well. So that's the first problem. We love being simple in some areas. So if it applies to you, then yes, you, you, you love being simple. And you've been there a long time. And so probably just screaming at us and how long do you want to do that? How, you know, why are you going to keep loving that? And we want to escape the simplicity. Problem number two is we lack self-control. And this is kind of the, 
Houdini genie part of the sermon, right? It's like, okay, that's great. Now what do we do? How do we, how do you get out of that? Right. And so, if I had self-control, I could develop some self-control. But yeah. And so, how do we? Uh, and so anyway, I just wanted to look at self-control in scripture briefly. Hopefully, some of it resonates and sticks with you. Uh, some of it's told to us. Some of it maybe we're just gonna have to dig in and try. But we'll teach about it a little bit. See if maybe some of it can stick, but uh, we lack self-control. Let's go to Titus 2, verse 2. And I just want you to listen for the word self-control. You can listen for perseverance. There's some of that in here, too. Um, you can listen for steadfast and the concept of discipleship, but just listen for, for uh, So we're just going to read Titus 2, 2 through 6. There's other stuff in here, but I'm just, we're listening for self-control. <laughs> Older men are to be sober-minded, dignified, self-controlled, sound in faith, in love, and in steadfastness. Older women, likewise, are to be reverent in behavior, not slanderers or slaves to much wine. They are to teach what is good. And so train young women to love their husbands and children, to be self-controlled, pure, working at home, kind, submissive to their own husbands, that the word of God may not be reviled. Likewise, urge younger men to be self-controlled. And I just want to realize that like, they went through a whole demographic. Is there anyone here that's not a young man, a young woman, an old man, or an old woman? Because all four of those guys had four verses and talked about self-control being part of all of them. It's just my wife is all I think of. I think she's 39, so she doesn't need any self-control because she's neither young nor old for one year, and then and then I guess you'll have to be self-controlled after that. So anyway, uh, self-control is a fruit of the Spirit. You can see we're all supposed to have it, uh, and, and, and at least in this one, it d example, the discipleship, did you notice the older women teaching the younger women? So there's an example there that we can follow where we can connect into each other's lives and we should be pushing for self-control. Young men that are in the church, and you guys can come and talk if you wanted to, how much would you pay or invest if you could go back in time and have a dad or a leader that just cranked on you some self-control earlier on? And then... It, you guys, if you talk to these guys, it is hard to get out of certain ruts, whether that be the way you're living, you know, finances, the way you serve, or what you do with your time. Uh, there's just so many areas of life where we become fruitful if we have self-control, and we're at a disadvantage if we don't have it early on. It doesn't change things. God's still going to use us. He's going to perfect us as we continue along. But anyway, I just want to appreciate when the parents pop, hop in there and appreciate when these opportunities occur for us to grow in, uh, in self-control. And for those of you that had self-control, have you seen the fruit of that? If you've been able to say, hey, I want to make a change in life with God's help, and you've actually executed and choose that, man, isn't that great? You can't do that without self-control. It's, you know, it's something you have to participate in. So anyway, how do we break the cycle? You know, I think we, uh, discipleship is part of that. And all I can do with these other verses is just to express the importance. I wish I could tell you a little bit more about how to. Proverbs 25, 28 says that self man without self-control is like a city without walls. So imagine as you're trying to fight this battle of improving in these areas, if you don't have any walls, you get run over. I'm going to try it. This time I'm going to be successful. And then like a week or two, he's going to mowed over. If you don't have self-control, you're like a city without walls, getting run over. Uh, and then final, finally, uh, 1 Peter 1, 5 through 10, there's a, a list, and it says, hey, if these attributes are in, with, are in you, and one of those attributes being self-control, then if they are in you and increasing, this is how you can know that you won't be unfruitful. So you can be, it's a, I just wanted to show that it is an active way of us knowing that we'll be fruitful is when self-control is increasing in our life. It actually goes beyond that and talks about how if they aren't in you and increasing, you're kind of blind. And it also talks about how if they are in you, it'll help you confirm your calling and election and brings a lot of security. So there's a lot. This, this is, it's a cumulative effect. We want self-control. We want to apply self-control. And we want to look caref live carefully and live as wise. Uh, 
We don't. We want to be. Uh, if we have the option of 30 talent, you know, 30 fold, 60 fold, 90 fold. If you remember this, we want to be the 90 fold. If you're the talents guy, you got one talent, five talents, ten talents. We want to be the five talent guy. We want to be ten talent guy. We want to. We're going to only be able to do that with uh, with self control. The only other thing I could find is maybe a helper for you on self control is some proverbs, and I just want you to realize the counterbalance between self-control and emotions. And a lot of times we get bought into the lie that I'll do it when I feel like it, or when I don't feel like it, I don't want to do what it is because then it's not authentic and I'm just forcing myself. You, know, you can kind of play head games with that and then you don't make any progress. I just want to give you two Proverbs to chew on. One of them is Proverbs 23, 12, and then that's also 23, 19. And it just mentions the phrase, apply your heart. And you can't do that without self-control. Your heart is heavily, some of your emotions, Scripture tells us to apply our heart. Troy will sometimes tell us, uh, emotions are great, are, are good motivators, but they're terrible taskmasters. If you do what your emotions are telling you to do, you're all over the map. We don't want to do that. We want to, you know, be, do, what the, do what truth tells us to do and, and, and follow you know, steadfast. There's another one that says, direct your heart. So it's not just this one verse. You can't direct your heart unless you have self-control. There's another one that says that discerning sets his face on wisdom. And so you have to have self-control to be able to set your face on wisdom because otherwise you're not, you know, you're going to do what you feel. So, and we got a lot of the world telling us, do what you feel. So, um, all right, so that was our second. Problem one, we love being simple. You know that whenever you, you're in a rut for a long time and you just love not changing. The second problem is that we just don't have self-control. And so um, we're supposed to apply our hearts and direct our hearts. If you can get to that part, if you can acknowledge in this, this arena, hey, I'm simple in some areas and I'm lacking in self-control, but you're going to find those areas and you're going to dig into them. And then if you're going to get self-control, I think you're in a position to be able to grow in wisdom. And this is what growing wisdom is. I think it's a process. And I'm going to give you three examples. The first of which is Solomon's prayer. In Solomon's prayer with God, whenever God's saying, hey, what do you want? You might recall that dialogue. We don't have time to go into it, but it's, it's, it's along the lines of, I am young and I don't know what I'm doing. So there's humility. That's awesome. It demonstrates wisdom already. God hasn't granted him wisdom yet, but he's already demonstrated it. I guess I just wanted to say that the wise just keep getting wiser. They're like the ten talent guy. He just keeps multiplying. It's like you either have it or you don't. So if you don't have it today, don't fret because the Lord preserves the simple. You can be wise. But this guy was like, I'm young. I don't know what I'm doing. The second thing he said was, uh, God, your, 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 your people are great. What you're doing is great. Your name is great. And I'm going to mess this up. It's something along these lines. There's a lot of... He understood the gravity of what God was trying to do. So he knew God's plan was really big. And the third thing was he knew that he needed help, so he's asking for wisdom. He's already demonstrated an immense amount of wisdom for a young guy who's typically not, in Scripture, a really hero. When they come to, if you're a king and you're really young, like you're really blowing it, typically, he's done the exact opposite. God hasn't blessed him, and he hasn't become the wisest man in the world, but he's already demonstrating wisdom. So anyway, I just wanted to show that like, it's almost like he was already in the process of growing wisdom. Like I said, Jesus grew in wisdom, Samuel grew in wisdom. And I want to give you two other verses that kind of help us think that maybe it's a process. The first one is super silly. James might have referenced it. Proverbs 4, 7. It's profound and dumb. It's, it's the beginning of wisdom is this. Get wisdom. And so you're like, okay, what do I, what do, I do with that? But I guess what I'm trying to tell you today is like, it's a, it's, a, it's a process. It's almost like, hey, go get it, and then you have it, and then go get it. And then you, and, and, and it's, and yes, that sounds silly, but that's literally what the scripture is saying. It's the beginning of wisdom is this. Get wisdom. Another verse that kind of gives me the sense that there's a cycle, and this is New Testament. The context is slightly different, but we're going to use it. 1 Corinthians uh, 3.18. First Corinthians 3.18. 18, let no one deceive himself. I'm probably saying that because we have a tendency to deceive ourselves. If anyone among you thinks that he is wise, you heard this one before? In this age, 
let him become a fool, that he may become wise. And I'm like, what? We're here again. I was like, what are we doing here? So it's like, you think you're wise, you become a fool, so you're wise. And Paul, what are you trying to tell me? I think that Proverbs is more than like a bunch of Confucius says stuff. Like when we go digging through, they're like, oh, that one's interesting. That one's talking about a dog that's vomit. It's really interesting. Like it's bigger than that. Like, I mean, it's telling us that there, there's, there's, there's a way we can grow in wisdom. So anyway, that's why I think that there's kind of a process going on, except you see that. Uh, the process I come up with, and this is not, you know, this is just a thing when I read Proverbs. So if I had to guess core elements of this process, if this is what I came up with, I'm going to give them to you, and then I'm going to read some verses on each of them, kind of like a buffet, and you guys can consume what you want, and then I'll try to put an application on it, and we'll, we'll, we'll be done. But the blank of the... The blank of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Have you heard that one? What is that? The fear. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. So we know there's a couple verses like that. There's a lot about what fear is and what the beginning. But yes, the fear of the Lord. So I think the fear, and notice that's beginning. So it's almost like there is a process there. There's a beginning of wisdom and it kind of cycles. So I'm anchoring onto that. I'm going to say, hey, fear, fear is part of this. It's at the beginning. And so think about how that... The second part was kind of what we call it, a seek or an ask. And there's a whole lot of proverbs about treasuring God, gold, like gold, like silver, keep the apple of your eye. And then finally, what might be the most important thing, because you can fear God, and then you can seek wisdom, and you can gain wisdom. And this is where James Jordan would probably be amen, would be like, do, you got to go out and actually do or take action. So you fear God, you seek wisdom, and then you actually do. So I've read through proverbs. And I kind of have some of these verses. I'm just going to put them out there, and then hopefully across all of them, some of them stick, and it paints a picture of, uh, of these things for you. But this is, this, this is the best I come up with what a potential growing and wisdom process might look like. Fear of the Lord. First, fear of the Lord. Fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Be not wise in your own eyes, but fear the Lord. Fear of the Lord is hatred of evil. Do you hate evil? I love I'm praying that God help us to hate what you hate. That would be wise. If we could just hate what you hate, man, how far along would we be? Fear the Lord. This, is, this one's comforting. Fear of the Lord gives a man strong confidence, and his children have a refuge. Fear of the Lord gives a man strong confidence. It's and, and the children have refuge. Man, fearing that God even impacts other people to kids. It's not just for you. By fear, one turns away from evil. If you fear God and believe He's real, and if the judgment's real, and that we've got this eternity coming, you're going you're gonna to turn away from evil. If you fear the Lord, you rest satisfied. One says, fear the Lord and the King, and don't join those who don't. Uh... And there's another verse that contrasts fear of the Lord versus hardening of the heart. So it says, oh, the fear of the Lord keeps you in a constant, ready state of improvement or of hearing from the Lord. So anyway, that's my fear buffet. Hopefully you can take some of that and say, that's what fear of the Lord is. Finally, and the one verse that helps me personally, I just want to share. It's not in Proverbs, but Psalm 39.4 said, show me, O Lord, my life's end and the number of my days. Let me know how fleeting my life is. I think he does that because we have this short time and we think it's long. If you had a ticker and it told you, hey, how many days you got left? And it went down one every day. I just think we behave a little differently. And so anyway, I found that helpful in me trying to fear the Lord to say, hey, what's my ticker? Like we have a limited time here on earth. What about a, what is it? Like a, like a vapor. All right, so we're going to fear God. I think that's the beginning. Now I want to go to... Uh, Ask, seek. This is pretty obvious too. I'm going to give you another buffet, and then you guys can process what you want. The first one I want to start at is Proverbs 2, beginning. Oh, Brian, cool. Proverbs 2. 2, 1 through 5. <clears throat> See if you. So we talked about beginning of wisdom, and this is get wisdom. The beginning of uh, fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. I'm kind of like, oh, okay, which one is it? I'm going to add another one in here that kind of tries to connect to the fear of the Lord. My son, if you receive my words, if you treasure up my commandments within you, 
making your ear attentive to wisdom, inclining your heart to understanding. Yes, if you call out for insight and raise your voice for understanding, if you seek it like silver, search for it as hidden treasures, then you will understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God. For the Lord gives wisdom. From his mouth come understanding, knowledge and understanding. So if you're like, that's great, I still don't quite get fear. This tells us that if you do all these things, you seek, it says you will understand the fear of the Lord. So once again, we kind of have this kind of never-ending circle of like fearing and then, and then seeking. So I'll give you a couple other verses about seeking. Uh, the obvious one we have to hit is James 1. And you guys have probably memorized or heard this many times. If any of you lacks wisdom, what do we do? Let him ask God who does what? He gives generously to all without reproach, and it will be given him. But let him ask in faith, without doubting. A couple other verses. It says the wise hear and increase in learning, so it's a process. It tells us to bind wisdom on our net. It tells us to prize for highly. It says whoever... Dil uh, diligently seeks good will find it. He who understands seeks knowledge. Listen to advice, accept instructions that you may gain wisdom in the future. Buy truth and don't sell it. Buy. This is the priority. You know, seek it. It's like go, go buy the field sort of thing. So you fear God. You seek God. And sometimes when you seek God, you start fearing God. But if you do that, we don't do anything. Our lives are lousy, and we still have not helped our gospel message when we're presenting. We're not going to bear fruit, and we're not going to be blessed. And so we have to do. And so I'm going to give you a buffet of do verses. Hopefully some of them stick or motivate us. So you actually need to move. There's one verse that says, In all toil there is profit, which means if you're working, then it makes you profit. Mere talk leads to poverty. So. Action is bigger than words. We already know this, but sometimes it's the word of God that needs to speak to us. James 1, 23-25, it's not from Proverbs, but it's totally applicable. I was already in James, I'm just going to come back down here. If anyone is a hearer of the word, not a doer, he's like a man who looks intently his natural face in the mirror. He, see, he looks at himself, goes away, and, wants, and at once forgets what he looks like. But the one who looks at the perfect law, law of liberty, and perseveres, it's hard, takes self-control, being no hearer who forgets, but a doer who acts, he will be blessed in his doing. If you come every Sunday and you're like, man, that was great. What did you talk about? I don't know. Man, it sure was great. That's the rock we can get out of it, too. I'm not mocking. I mean, it's, it's just it's what we're going to naturally do unless we like, you know, unless we actually make a change. That's why Troy is so... Hey, what do we do with this? How do we change our lives? A lot of those questions, and sometimes they get rhetorical and almost boring, but that's why Troy keeps having that application. There's a verse that says, in my, do in my absence just like, like you know, what you want in my presence. And this is the idea of integrity. This is really key. Who are you when no one else is around? When church isn't around, when your spouse isn't around, whoever motivates you spiritually, if they're not around. We talk about the small group, Trey, Jed, Molly, we talked about occasionally, if somebody zapped you and pulled you out of your families and put you in another family, another country, they don't know anything about God, how much of that is in your DNA to where you're going to do all these things we talked about? Are you going to grow in patience? Are you going to read? Are you going to join a church? Are you going to memorize? Is it part of who you are? Are you just doing it because dad's here? And now this is, I'm sure they're picking on the kids, but speak to you know, everyone else too. Why do you do what you do? Are you pursuing God as part of your DNA? Did God change you? Are you doing it because of others around you? And so, anyway, that's what that Paul verse reminds me of, saying, hey, you know what? just behave like I'm there, even when I'm not there. It's that idea of integrity. If you hear integrity, that's what that is, right? Behaving in a way as though the other person's there, even when they're not there. So the integrity of the upright guides them. Behave like an ant who, without chief or ruler, does what he's supposed to do. But go to the ant slaughter, look at the ant, Ant doesn't have a leader, he just keeps working. Do we do that? Man, gosh, I'm just praying that each of us, it's great we're all here today, Sunday, Mo uh, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. Uh, you know, that's when we need to be like an ant, because maybe not everyone's around. It's because the locusts have no king, they keep doing what they need to do. Uh, whoever walks in integrity walks securely. Whoever walks with a wise man will be wise. Companion of fools will be destroyed. 
And finally, uh, it says, commit your steps to the Lord and your plans will be established. And so we need to actually take action. So what was it? We, we love being simple, so we're stuck. We don't have self-control, so we don't really escape simplicity. But if we can get some self-control, this is what we need to do. We need to grow in wisdom. We need to fear God. We need to seek wisdom. And then we need to actually take an action. So that, that's, that's kind of my summary. How might that look on one of these practical areas? I'll just take waking up in the morning. When are you going to wake up tomorrow? Why are you, going to, why are you doing what you're doing? Do you get up tomorrow because people will think more highly of you? Do you get up because at the time you get up because, man, you just want to enjoy as much beauty sleep as you possibly can before you can get out of bed? Do you get up just so you can be productive? Or do you get up because God is worthy and he has a desire for how and he cares about when you get up? So I'm suggesting we fear God and do, you know, these other things matter some, but like our primary motivator when we fear God is we're going to make these decisions based on and so anyway, pick that for you tomorrow. We all should do that. I don't know what it looks like and when you get up, but it's just it. Another way is, so then how do you seek wisdom? How do we know when to get up? Maybe talk to somebody else that seems really skillful at getting up. And you'd be like, that guy always seems to do this, and I'm terrible at it. This is one that was for me. It's embarrassing to say. I wouldn't go to a morning person. I hate getting up in the morning. I can't do anything. I was working, and I would be so tired when I go to work in the morning. It's embarrassing, but I talked to him. Troy, I don't think Troy knows this, I don't told me this. But I was like, uh, I don't like getting up in the morning, whatever. And he's talking to someone else, and he's just like, well, I found that if you go to bed earlier, your body just gets up earlier in the morning. And I'm like, man, how dumb is that? And he's like, but it's true. And you can ask my family, I like to drag, I wouldn't eat breakfast, I could say, oh, now I'm my first guy up in the morning. It's went to bed early. And, but it felt stupid when you're doing it. It feels stupid going to bed at 10 o'clock and going to bed at midnight or after midnight for a long time. Like, what are we doing? This is dumb. But that's where we need to seek wisdom. And in that case, I, learned, I heard from Troy, but there's verses on this too. It says, don't wall around like a bed hinge, like the slugger. Remember this proverb? It's like, don't, don't you know, the slugger's just going to flop back and forth on the bed sort of thing. He wants us to be productive in the morning, get work done, and then, you know. Uh, so there, there's verses about this, and then we need to pray about it. Anyway, all that to say is when I'm seeking, I'm listening for these attributes. I'm not leaning on my own understanding. And that's doing things God's way, seeking wisdom, instead of just doing it because, hey, that's what your parents say to do it, or you're doing whatever you want to do. And finally actually doing it. Had I figured all that out, and then not actually made a change in my life, I'm not waking up in the area. Oh, wow, I figured it all out, but didn't actually do it. I think the key here is don't just do it for yourself and don't just try something out, but go ahead and commit to it. Here's how I'll do this. It's not prescriptive. You can join me if you'd like, but Katie will tell you too. I've got this. I didn't really know that this is what I was doing, but in hindsight, this is what I was doing. At 5 p.m. on Sunday, so today, I've got a calendar reminder, and it just comes on at 5, and it says plan. And I've got a notes section on my, my phone, and... There are probably a hundred things on my list I'd love to grow in wisdom on. But do I have a hundred things on that list? No, I don't. I have like, I don't just have one thing also, but I got five or six things because I've learned through integrity and, and working on these things, I can improve most of those things. Do I improve all the five or six things I've kind of got on there? It's a mixture of things. Some of it's not necessarily spiritual. It's health or fitness or maybe I'm going to spend time one-on-one -on -one with the kids or go on a date or uh, witness to somebody during the week or whatever that is. And, 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 uh, and I, I just review that list once a week and I try to, to, and I try to figure out, okay, am I fearing God in these areas? Am I making changes? So that's, that's what I do. Uh, I encourage you to get engaged somehow in growing in wisdom so that we can uh, have a better witness and then bear fruit and then also we'll all be blessed. So anyway, appreciate uh, you guys listening. And that's my message on growing in wisdom. If you have an area that you want to talk about, you know, let someone know. Or come let me know if you want, because I'm excited about it. And then we'll grow together. So.